Amen. Everybody okay this morning? Yeah. Any point for any reason you need to leave, you're not going to offend me one bit? You can't promise you're not going to offend God. That's between you and him. So, but, <laughs> um, Ephesians 3. Uh-huh. Hallelujah. The Apostle Paul writes, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now had been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. I feel know the gospel is powerful. He said in verse 7, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God which was given to me by the effective working of his power. Grace that was given by the effective working of his power. To say that grace has impacted your life and you're still a, a wretched sinner is to mistreat and misunderstand grace. He said grace was at work in my life to the effective working of his power. And then how he responds to that, effective working of his power, and he says to me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given. God doesn't need much to work with. Seriously. Sometimes we look at people through the eyes of our own understanding and we say, they're a hopeless cause. They're too far gone, they don't want to hear the gospel. How do you know? They probably want it more than the religious people that are gathered together in churches Sunday to Sunday. They just haven't heard yet. I think we ought to be careful how we treat grace, because grace is powerful and effective. Amen? It works. It works. He says, to me, I'm less than the least of all the saints. Verse 9 says, and to make, oh, actually, let me not skip, to, to me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. I want you to pay attention to these words, unsearchable riches of Christ, unsearchable riches of Christ. And verse 20 says, to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly. So if we're dealing with unsearchable riches, and he says it's even beyond anything that you could comprehend or understand, God is big, amen, and his promise and his purpose is bigger than you think. He says, verse 9, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. Verse 10 says, to the intent that now, can you say now? You say now? How many people like now? Can we say it one more time? Because I like the word now. now. Amen. Amen. To the end that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Boldness and confidence, access through faith in him. Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which it's your glory. You know, don't feel bad for people when they're going through a difficult time. People often want to get out of those things. And I continue to try to remind people, listen, don't try to escape too quick. God's going to do something profound in that place. Amen? Amen? Stop getting your eyes on yourself and start looking to the reality of what God wants to do through you because God's purpose hasn't changed through your predicament. Let me say that again. God's purpose hasn't changed through your predicament. His purpose remains the same. God's purpose is eternal. I mean, think about it. We named the capital of Rhode Island. It was named by our, our, our forefathers, Providence. How many people know that God has a purpose? A divine plan. It's written in our very capital. That God's overarching plan is still there in this state. No matter how secular we get, we still call it Providence. We don't even realize what we're saying, but we're still making that declaration every time. Where are you flying into? It's interesting. We don't call it Warwick Airport. We call it Providence Airport. 
Every time, all the time, God's providence and his promise and his purpose is being spoken over this state. And I want to remind you of that fact. God's purpose hasn't changed through our predicament of our political structure or through the pollution of what we call the Roman Catholic Church or whatever else has happened in evangelicalism. God's purpose has not changed. It remains the same and we have to stay hopeful. Is anybody with me this morning? We've got to stop being in a rush to get out of the presence of God, and we've got to embrace those things. I was sharing it, we were singing that song this morning. What a friend I found, closer than a brother. I have felt your touch is more intimate than lovers. Jesus, written in 1996 by Martin Smith of Delirious. And I remember in college, I would just sit in my car with that song playing. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, friend forever. And I would just get lost in the presence of God. I just want to just stay there. I don't want to move. When you're in the presence of God, you just don't want to move. You just want to stay there. But we got all our schedules and everything, and we got our phone, the alarm's going off. It's time to go, time to eat. Our stomach's going off. If we could treat ourselves to learn to eat from the bread that comes down from heaven, we wouldn't be so hungry from all the bread that does not satisfy in six hours, you're going to be hungry again anyway, or five hours, or four hours. We're Americans, might be a half hour. <laughs> and just to sit, and just to be in the presence of God, and to, to dwell and meditate upon his purpose, because if we don't, we're going to get in a rush, and we're going to look at all the things that are going on around us, and we're going to be discouraged. And we're going to forget that God's purpose still remains the same. God has a purpose. Amen? And it's eternal. So if things are happening in your life right now, and it's like, I don't understand this predicament I find myself in, this particular current season of my life. Listen, God's plan isn't wrapped up in the right now. It's eternal. And God's working out an eternal purpose through the things we find ourselves in. So don't get so discouraged. Remain hopeful. Patient in affliction. Trust in the Lord. Is anybody with me this morning? God's word is true, and he's hopeful. We've got to remain hopeful. My tribulation is your glory. My tribulation is your glory. I have to look back and laugh sometimes. The hardest seasons of my life end up being, you know, the things that encourage people the most. Right? If you didn't have a test, you wouldn't have a testimony. And it's like, it's, it's fun to get out of those situations for sure. I'd rather talk about it than walk through it. Amen? Amen. I'd rather testify over it than walk through the test of it. But guess what? Those things don't happen until you walk through it. And God is working in it. And you need to be encouraged through it. Praise God. Guess this is verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or even think, according to the power that works in us. He didn't say me, he said us. You see, I'm going through some stuff, but this is for us. This isn't just for me, this is for us. See, don't lose heart at my tribulations. This is our glory. This is your glory because we're going through some stuff. God's revealing stuff in the stuff. And it's our glory. Amen? It's a power that's working in us. Now to him, be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Man, what a great chapter of scripture, isn't it? This morning I want to talk about a love that flows down. A love that flows down. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Well, let's start from the get-go. So if you're taking notes, could you write down an acronym in the words down? This is the way that God operates with mankind down. 
And that's why it's important, the position that we take with God. I'm learning that a humble position is the attitude that we should always have with God because everything flows down from Him. And the, and the lower we get, the more... It, I was talking about this even in, in Psalm 133, the anointing of Aaron, the priest. And when the oil was poured upon his head, it literally pulled at his feet. Think about that. The grace of God flows to the lowest of places, and there it pulls... Thus says the High and Holy One who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. This is where I dwell with the humble and contrite one. Right? And the, the prouder you position you take with God, the, the more you find that he passes by you. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That the position we find when things are flowing down, that you want to take the lowest place, right? Jesus said this at the banquet feast. He said, don't take the highest position, take the lowest position, because then the master of the table will come and say, you're not supposed to be at the lowest position, you're supposed to be at the highest position, and, and there you will find yourself elevated in the presence of all God's people because you took the humble position. But if the ones that fought for the high position, the one come to the master house, come and look at them and say, listen, that seat's been reserved for someone else. You come and take the low position and you'll be humbled in the presence of your Lord. The ones who are, are, are proud in this world will be humbled. And the ones who are humble will be exalted. Amen? And it's important as we deal with God how our attitude is towards him. Even in our posture, our posture should be one of, of humility and not one of pride. We've become very self-confident. I can, I can see it even in our body language. Body, those who, who know communication understand that body language speaks a lot. You know? And you know, I, I share, even when you're sharing the Word of God, I, the greatest posture that I can think of is this right here. Personally, this is the posture I like to take when I'm hearing the Word of God. It's a posture of I'm, I'm listening, I'm taking notes, I'm, I'm paying attention to what's being spoken because I want to really be able to dissect and, and, and uh, go a little deeper in this for myself, you know? The Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians, uh, the Thessalonians because they heard what Paul preached. They went to the scriptures and verified whether these things were so or not. Listen, you're going to be much better off if you would actually validate the things that have been spoken to you because you find out by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word is established. And it's time for the word of God to get established in our hearts, not just heard and do nothing, but actually be established in our life because if the word would be established, guess what? It'd become part of who I am and now it's a part of my being and the promise that's associated with it has become now my promise. Amen? Anybody with me this morning? Yes? Amen? It's just like prof prophetic word. You've got to receive it. Right? You've got to test all things. Do not despise prophesying. Test all things. Hold fast that which is good. What happens when you hear what God has spoken, you test it to see if this was in fact God, and all of a sudden you begin to speak the things that God spoke, guess what happens? Those things become so. Right? Amen? Amen. Don't you have to speak those things to be so? Yes. How many people have spoken death over your life before? You have, haven't you? Proverbs says death and life are in the power of the tongue. Blessing and curse are in the tongue. Right? Choices are reflected in the tongue because what's going on inside the heart, it's time for us to agree with what God says. So if you're right now, write an acronym down, down, D-O-W-N. And uh, the first D, I want you to write the word divine enablement. Divine enablement. We're going to find this uh, as God works in our lives that everything flows down. In fact, uh, Paul says this, that this is, where the comp uh, this is where the fullness or being filled with all the fullness of God comes from, that you might be able to comprehend with all the saints, right? Depth and width and length and height to, to know the love of God, which passes knowledge. Now, we shared a little bit that last week. The word knowledge there is a Greek word gnosis. Gnosis was, was really important in this particular generation. There was a whole group called the Gnostics, and their whole, their whole thought was that they could attain to God through their esoteric or their higher level of knowledge. In fact, they believed that everything matter was evil. Everything was based upon uh, you know, developing their mind. And uh, they, they rejected, and the scriptures deal with the Gnostics, they rejected the, the bodily, you know, the, the idea of God coming in bodily presence in the person of Jesus Christ. They did not believe, you know. Anyone that believes that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh is anti-Christ, right? John wrote, the beloved disciple. And that was a Gnostic belief, that Christ did not come in the flesh. How could he come in the flesh? Matter is evil. And how could God, who's almighty or all-powerful, come as a man. Yet there was no redemption for them because in their thought of attaining to God through their knowledge, they rejected the one who had come to save them. Because their whole knowledge was not based upon what God had said, but their own ideas. You understand that when we get our own ideas, it confuses the whole matter. And we toss out the things that God is revealing to us. Say, that couldn't possibly be God. And here God is incarnate, walking among them to save them, and they're rejecting it. It passes knowledge. 
a time where Paul could write these letters and, and understand he was combating these type of philosophies. You know, you remember Acts and, and uh, where Paul goes to Mars Hill and, he, and he's dealing with those in Athens and the Athenians love to hear and to tell some new thing, some new doctrine, some new information. They, would, they loved it. They loved to talk about these things because for them, if they could grab a hold of these things, it might be a, another lifting point up to God. And Paul comes and says, God's not far away from any of us. In fact, we live and move and have our being in him. But if we would humble ourselves and take a humble posture, we'd find that he would be there. You want to elevate yourselves. God wants to bring you down. The high places are to come down. The low places are to be raised up. Crooked places are to be made straight and make a way for the Lord to come. That you might be able to comprehend. That word comprehend is the word katalambano in Greek. K-A-T-A-L-A-M-B-A-N-O. Composition of two words. Cat is a preposition. And... Um, You'll see it translated against or according or down. Uh, but it, in, in the way in which it uh, is given as a, a preposition, it, it deals with the issue of flowing from a higher level to a lower level, from a superior to an inferior, the idea of the direction of downward. Okay, catch that? Down. Amen? Down. That you might comprehend what is the love of God. How deep, wide, high, long. That you might comprehend with all the saints. The second part of that word is the word lambano. The word lambano means to take hold of or to grasp. In John 1 and verse 12, it says, He came to his own, his own did not receive him, but as many as lambano received him, to them he gave power to become the children of God. And so this idea of grasping or taking hold of comes this idea of, of comprehension. So what it comes down to is that you might grasp what's flowing towards you. That you gotta, it's coming down, but you need to take hold of it. You understand? With well, the things that come down from God, they're coming down, but they, they require a response. You with me this morning? They require a response that you need to take hold of the things that are flowing down from God because many things are flowing. The blessings of God flow daily. Are you with me? The blessings of God flow daily. Are, are the blessings of God constantly flowing into this world? Have all, have all those who are, who, are, who are occupying this world become recipients of those blessings? Have they not? Or are many blessings just flown right by? Is that true or is it not? Is God not constantly at work within the created order? God's not the God who's disinterested in what he's done. He's not out there as the, as the, you know, the, the, the force that put everything into motion and now just stands outside and lets it do its thing. That's not the God that I serve. That's not the God that I see in the Bible. That God is very much working a purpose in his people. His eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus, right? Before the world began. God is at work. Anyway, with me this morning. So we see this idea that things flow down. Things flow down from God, but there's a response on our part. And as we understand that things flow down, we see that through those things that flow from God comes this, divine enablement. It's the work of God. Amen? The work of God, divine enablement comes from God, does it not? I mean, have you ever been confronted with something that was too much for you, too difficult for you? Of course you have if you've been born again. It was the whole issue of your salvation. You couldn't do it. You couldn't work it up. You couldn't fulfill the demands of the law. When it came to the law, you understood this fact that you're a sinner, you're wretched, and you're incapable of saving yourself from your own demise. The harder you tried, the more you broke it. The more it came to, to confront you on the fact that you were wrong, the more you wanted to do what was wrong. This is what the law did in us. Right? The law, it just gave leverage to sin. It didn't give any leverage to me to overcome sin. That's what the Bible says. Paul wrote that to the Romans. And so God wants us, see, divine enablement is a necessary component of our salvation. You didn't save yourselves. You were saved by grace, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, right? We would take a posture of pride. No, no posture of pride will ever last in the presence of God. The humble will always be the one that God works with. That's why David says, a broken heart and a contrite spirit you've yet to despise. That's why Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount started, said, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. This is the posture that God responds to. Why? Because they understand. I need that which flows down. I need divine enablement in my life. Listen, I could stretch forth my hands to pray over. Nothing's going to happen. But if God stretches forth his hand, when I stretch forth my hand, then healing transpires. Amen? When I speak, my words do nothing. It just reaches you on a level there. But if the word of God is proceeding out of my mouth, something's going on on the inside of you. You can't explain it. I can't explain it. I don't know what's going on. I can't see it. I could see you just sitting there like this. But really on the inside, something's going on. I don't know. 
But if it's the word of God, divine enablement. That's why Peter said, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. And anyone ministers, let him minister with the ability that comes from God. We need a divine enablement. Right in verse 7, he said this, of which I became a minister according to the gift of grace given to me by the effective working of his power. Amen? Effective working of his power. So you can put verse 7 right next to divine enablement. It's the work of God. Verse 16, it says this, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. You need divine enablement. He said, I need divine enablement to preach it, and you need divine enablement to receive it. Amen? Isn't that what he said? So when it comes to the issue of God's grace and God's love that flows down, we need divine enablement. We need, first and foremost, we need a one who's speaking with a prophetic voice, and secondly, we need the inner working of the Spirit to receive what's being spoken. We need divine enablement. Everybody with me this morning? O brings us to O. Um, we could call this our response. Our response. Or we could, since it's O, we could put the word obedience. Amen? Obedience. That God would grant you the ability to comprehend with all the saints. The four-dimensional aspect that extends infinitely the vastness of the love of God. The love of God, the hymn writer says. If every stock on earth was a quill, if every man a scribe by trade, if the ocean were filled with ink and the heavens extended out were a scroll, the love of God would drain the ocean dry. And tongue could not contain the whole, the scroll could not contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. The love of God. The love of God. We live in a broken world. People have lived in dysfunction their entire lives. They haven't known love a love that's not seeking its own, a love that's not, what can I get from it? The very few have actually experienced this love that just, that builds up and 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 builds up. The love we know is give and take. The love we know is earned by your performance. The love we've been accustomed to is, you know, is that type of love, but the love of God is, is far beyond anything that we really comprehend or understand because it's not like the love of this world. The love of God. And we live in a dysfunctional world that's broken and, and so the love that's often exhibited within our relationships is human love. You did me wrong, I'll do you wrong. You, know, you mistreated me, I won't speak to you. And the condition of our heart is actually revealed in that, that we're not living out of the outflow of God's love, we're living out of the outflow of human love. And we're not divinely enabled and therefore we're not really obedient to the purpose of God. Amen? Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. There's obedience. There's the love of God perfected in our lives. If you love me, you would obey me. So we need to take hold of the things that God has given to us, right? Divine enable is just something we could talk about, write down in our notepads. Divine enable is something that we need to live in. Anybody with me this morning? Right? John said in the first chapter, he said, you were not born the will of man. You weren't born of the flesh. No, you were born of God, right? First John, you were born of God. That which we heard from the beginning. Which we've handled with our hands. The word of God. We handle it because this is it. Christ came in the flesh, amen? We took hold of him. So there's got to be a reception. You've got to receive the word of God. You've got to receive the word of God. The W. Um, I want you to write what it is. What it is. And next to that, you can put the word revelation. Because Paul writes this. Now, granted, I know this is in the English, but it really caught my attention. It says that he would grant you in verse 16, according to the verse of his glory, to be strengthened with his might through his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Love precedes everything, folks, in our lives, right? It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. It's the love of God that roots us and prepares us for everything else, right? You need to have the love of God like manifest in your life before you worry about working for God. Work will come later. Love sitting at the feet of Jesus precedes working all over the house like Martha. Mary's position is better. We need to know the love of God before we can work really effectively for him. Is anybody with me this morning? 
we really need to, to bask in the reality of, of identity in Christ and understand our identity so that we're not working out of our own outflow, but we're working out of his overflow. Amen? Let me say that again. We're not working out of what we can produce by our outflow, but we're working rather out of his overflow. Amen? Amen? That's abundant life. Everybody with me today? Amen? Amen? Verse uh, 18, that, that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints... I hope you'll know that this is for all the saints. This isn't just for a like, few. This is for everybody. Paul's writing this, all the saints, right? Uh, all the saints. I, I had you share this, but I want you to say it again. Look at my neighbor and say, you're a saint. You're a saint. You're a saint. Okay. You're a saint. There, for a little while, off of, um, off of 95, right over where 195 crosses over it, there was... It used to be P.J. Fox Company, and there was uh, one little building there, and it went through various different things. At one point, it became a bar, and it, and it was called Sinners and Saints. I don't know if anybody remembers that. I'm thinking you could erase the second part, because um, that's not where saints are to be gathering. But you're a saint. Amen? You're a saint. Amen? You're a saint. It's, it's, stop, it's time to, to erase the first part in your life, and understand the identity we have in Jesus Christ because of what transpired on the cross, because the blood was shed for you to no longer refer to yourself as a sinner. See, death and life are in the power of your tongue. You keep calling yourself a sinner and you wonder why you sin. If you could still start calling yourself a saint and start seeing yourself walk victoriously, that's what we need to do. We're saints. You're a saint. Amen? You're a saint. You're a saint. You're a saint. Why? Because of what Christ has done. You're a saint. Amen? You don't need to put anybody, anybody putting a sword on your shoulder. Christ has put a sword in your hand. You're a saint. Amen? Everybody still okay? Yes. What it is, that's revelation, right? That you might be able to comprehend with all the saints, what is? Can you say what is? What is? You know, how, many people, how many people know we live in that place? I, I, I feel like most Christians live in this place. What is? Like, it was actually, a uh, prophetic word was, you know, um, that idea of, of like asking and, and, and there's like this level of confusion. You've been asking it and just like, uh, what am I supposed to do? What do you want? What do you, what do you, I mean, how many people live in the what? Let's be honest with me. How many people live in the what? Or the why? Like, it's, it's like you don't have the answers to it. It's just a question. It's like an open-ended question. God's working, but your response to that is, what is it? Ex- case in point, Exodus chapter 16. Okay, you guys are very familiar with it. Um, the people come out of the wilderness. They go and they get into the wilderness of sin. Or sin. <laughs> right? Yeah, we remember. And, and God, what did he do? How did he get in there? He said, these 10 miraculous plagues. And then he says, let's, let's open up the sea. Let's walk through the sea. And let's not walk through muddy waters. Let's walk through dry land. Let's get to the other side. So this million plus people walk through the, the dry land, through the waters on their side, just looking, hey, man, it's, you know, it's cool stuff in the Red Sea. You know, I used to snorkel, you know, and I used to enjoy seeing the stuff that's under the water. They're just looking at it right there, you know, and they're walking their way and, and, uh, you know, it is, and, and they get on the other side, and all of a sudden they, they hear the, the chariots coming and, and the armies of Pharaoh in Egypt coming after them. And it's just like us, you know, God's done a miraculous thing. How many people know the biggest testing will come place right after a miraculous event? Like the biggest testing will take place right there. I mean, by the, before, like God will have a miraculous service taking place. I mean, you walk out the door. Sometimes you don't even get out the door, and already the attack has started. And don't be surprised when God's working in your life. Some people, like, they, they talk it off as, oh, that wasn't really God moving. No, that, that's showing that it was God moving. Because the enemy will try to attack you when God's doing something good. And so, it's, I mean, they're not even through the water yet, and here comes the enemy. That's the way the enemy works. But then the waters come, destroy all the chariots, and now the army that's the most powerful army in the world has just been decimated. And they're like, man, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. You hungry? Yeah, I'm hungry. I can go for a Whopper or something. And, and they're like, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. And, and you know what happens? Like, he brought us out here to kill us. Right? I mean, it, already, it started already. Say, man, I want to go back to Egypt. At least we had food to eat there. I'm like, dude, you were slaves. It started, right? We're hungry. We're hungry. Moses, we're hungry. It's like the little kid in the back said, we're hungry. Are we there yet? Keep talking that way. We're never going to get there. And, and, and this is the story, right? And, and all of a sudden, they begin to, and they can bring a complaint against Moses, and, and Moses brings it before the Lord, and God's like, hey, watch what I'm going to do. 
and quail come down on the ground, right? And then they leave, and there's this stuff all over the ground. And the response is, what is it? What is it? What is it? And so many of us live in that place. What is it? And we're, we're, we so much want to find out what it is that we're not enjoying what it is. Did you catch that? We're, we're so looking for revelation that we're not experiencing the reality of what God has just given to us. I don't care what it is. It's good. Amen. Amen? Amen. I don't need to define what it is. I need to eat it and get it on the inside because I need to be sustained by what God has just given me because this is the bread that God has sent down from heaven. Amen. And here we are. What is it? Because manna means, what is it? That's what manna means. What is it? And so he's saying that you might be able to comprehend what is. That you might be able to comprehend, not be able to define it. So many Christians want to define it. I'm at the point in my life where I want to live in it. Amen? They used to say it's better felt than telt. God wants us to live in it. He wants us to live in the reality of his divine enablement. He wants us to live in obedience to the, to the purpose of his will. He wants us there. His eternal purpose. Like verses before it says, according to his eternal purpose. That word according is the word kata. It's like the divine purpose of God. Everything flows down. Everything flows down from God. Amen? Can you say God's love and God's grace flow down? They flow down, taking the humble position. What is it? We, i got to close here. In John 6, Jesus deals with the whole issue of bread that comes down from heaven. And he says, you know what? He says, Moses isn't the one that gave you bread from heaven. My father has given you the true bread that comes down from heaven. And he goes on to say, you know what? Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they're dead. That scares me to death. Did you catch that? In other words, this was the love of God coming down for his people. Like they weren't doing it right, but God was still providing for them. Here the manna is for them, and it, and it was like coriander seed, and it tasted like, like wafers and honey. I mean, that's good. But to the satisfied soul, even the, even the, the honeycomb becomes loathsome. And even the sweet taste that, that, becomes, that God has given, and and everything that, the whole picture of what that was there. And in John chapter 6, Jesus had just finished feeding the 5,000 in the wilderness. And it was Passover time. So he was like breaking Passover meal. It was like communion table. He's breaking it there in the wilderness for the 5,000 men, by the way. Who knows how many thousands there were, would include the women and the children. There was a lot. And Jesus fed all these people through the breaking of his body, you know. And, and he, he just continued to provide. And, the, and they come after him and say, like, give us this bread that comes down. From, like, we want more bread. We want more bread. And Jesus is like, I'm the true bread that comes down from heaven. Like, you want miracles. Show us another miracle. Show us another sign. Provide for us another thing. And Jesus is like, you don't even understand that I am. Right? I am. I am the bread that's come down from God. That if you eat this bread, you will live forever. Your fathers ate bread, which they didn't know what it was. They didn't comprehend. They didn't understand. It was flowing down, but they weren't grasping it. You get with me this morning. There was no, compre there was no grasping. There was no taking hold of it. These things were written, to, as Paul wrote to the Corinthians, as examples for us in whom the age had fallen, that we would learn not to lust after evil things. Stuff, stuff, stuff. Do a miracle so we can have stuff. And, and God is like, I want you to understand who he is, that Jesus has come for a reason, that you would feast on him. Amen? Everybody still good? Yep. We're actually doing good on time. And uh, I told you I came across this book when I was sharing the um, Master in the Mundane, uh, E. Stanley Jones, and you don't have to agree with everything he says. And he went, I quote, you don't have to agree with everything they say, but they say something good, I'm going to read it. And um, he talks about seven particular pillars that are, that are given in the book of Acts in the first chapter referencing Jesus Christ. The first, the word of God uh, become flesh. Then the word of God becoming revelation. The word of God becoming um, vicarious. And the word of God, and he goes in, and shares these seven things. And, and as he goes down each one, he says, each one in and of itself is not sufficient enough. It's not until we get to the seventh pillar, which is this, which is the word of God has become... Um, alive and dynamic through the work of the Holy Spirit. 
that it's not just enough to know what Jesus has done, but we have to experience the realities of what Christ has purchased, that we would receive his spirit. Amen? He says, uh, we've looked at the divine preparation as seen in the first five pillars on which the Christian faith rests, and then at the divine promises as seen in the last two pillars. We must look now at the divine performance as seen in the rest of the Acts. This is the greatest drama ever enacted, the drama of redemption of humanity moved from preparation to promise to performance. The preparation was the Lord became flesh, the Word became revelation, the Word became vicarious, the Word became victorious through the conquering of the grave, and the Word became final. The promise was a new and total way to live. And so the kingdom of God, and you know, the sixth pillar was the Word of God uh, became a total way of life. And it was the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom, a total way of life. And he says, the kingdom of God and the offer of a divine dynamic to make it possible was this, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. But someone objects, where is the church in all this? Is not one of the pillars upon which the Christian faith rests? The church is more a product than a pillar. It is something that emerged out of the impact of these divine facts upon human life. It was a product of the divine performance. It's the building that was reared on these divine pillars where you have seen these seven things in vital operation, you have the church as a result. Where they are vitally absent, then you do not have the church, you have an organization, not an organism. You have a building built on sand and the gates of hell do, do prevail against it. It falls or slowly decays and, the, and great are both the fall and the decay thereof. So in the opening chapters of Acts, the church is not mentioned either by Jesus or by the disciples, for it was not yet born. Even by the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, the church was not born. So when they say that Pentecost was the birthday of the church, this is only partly true. Forces were loose that produced the church throughout producing the fellowship, the koinonia. The koinonia became the soul of the church, and out of it grew the church. It was the organism out of which, the, which grew the organization, and there, uh, where there is no fellowship, no koinonia, there's no church. But we will return to this later. We must now turn to the vital fact and factor which produced this amazing moral and spiritual mastery, namely the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was God in action, and how? And so, there's another part I wanted to read, but we'll, we'll leave it at that. The dynamic of the Holy Spirit is such an important part of the church. So the divine name, everything is it focused back to this realization that we need the Holy Spirit in order to have anything that comes from Christ and comes from God. Amen? And so our comprehension comes not through intellectual knowledge. He says, no, this passes knowledge. This is a work of God. And so what it comes down to is you can't be full of God's spirit unless you're hungry, unless you're empty, unless you recognize your desperate need. Many Christians, they get the first five parts and they think that they have what they need, but they don't realize that they're missing such a, an important component. In fact, the most important component. Jesus said there's a baptized and to be baptized and oh, I wish I was already kindled. That Jesus' ultimate will and desire was that the Holy Spirit would come that he wouldn't just be with his disciples working, otherwise he would have stayed longer in active ministry than three and a half years. You understand what I'm saying? But the work of the Holy Spirit is to this day still at work within his disciples from generation to generation to generation to generation. It's the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. It's not the work of the Holy Spirit. And so as, as I close this morning on the end, I want to just, uh, before I unveil that, that last word, um, I want to remind you, of some things is that God desires that we would be filled with all his fullness. Verse 19, that we would know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you might be filled. Can you say filled? filled. This morning, can you say filled? filled? With all the fullness of God. That you might be filled with all the fullness of God. In other words, that your fullness will be based upon your concept of how God is loving. That's why when you know God as a true father, that you know that he would never give bad gifts to his children. God would never put us in a detrimental position when he's offering to us something. You know, there's a lot that passes for Christianity today that's not Christianity. But I'll tell you this, when it comes to the fullness of the Holy Spirit, this is the will of God. Amen? This is the will of God. There's no, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I want to get to the point that this is the will of God. But he, he kind of leaves a disclaimer here because as we look at, and as I'm moving to the closing here, we look at this word filled here with all the fullness of God. When it talks about fullness, it's talking about literally the overflow it's talking about all that comes out of God. I mean, can you just, you can't even wrap your mind around this, that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. So I want to just look at that word filled here for just one moment, and then I want to jump to, to a, a, a further chapter to look at the word filled one more time, and we're going to close. Everybody okay with that? 
And so we, we looked at what it is, manna. Um, we looked at Jesus is the true bread that comes down from heaven. So we went from the fact that we need divine enablement. We need obedience to the call. We need to take hold of what God has given to us. We need to have revelation of what God's love is, what it is. It's not just enough to define it. We need to know and we need to, we need to feast on the promise that God has given to us. Amen? Everybody still with me? And now it brings us to this practice. I believe that God's will is that we would be filled. And the verse here in chapter 3, verse 19 of Ephesians, the word filled, uh, always being a verb, it, it operates in a tense, a voice, and a mood. And I want to just read those to you just to give you a little bit of understanding. And then we're going to jump forward and we're going to close here within a matter of three or four minutes. Okay? You guys good still? And it says this. So in the, in the tense, it's in the aorist. In the voice, it's in the passive. In the mood, it's subjunctive. Which means this. The aorist tense is this, the concept of the verb is considered without regard for past, present, or future time. So in the aorist uh, uh, tense, time is of, not of the essence. It, it's, it's, uh, this is a moment that, that could be taken of, advantage of. In fact, we're getting to the word, that the N, you want to write it down, is the word now. Okay, can you write the word now? Now. Amen. Um, I was talking to a brother a while back, and he says, you know, I find that most people in the church are just sitting around, just kind of like, with this like, it's almost like a false sense of hope. It's, it's like a, you know, God will do something someday off far in the future, but, but there's really no active engagement that God is a God that wants to work now. Can you say with me now? now. I want you to catch this now. Amen now? Amen. I'm not content with this right here. I'm just not. I'm not. I'm not content with this. I mean, I want to see a, a, a body right here full of people that are dynamically empowered by the Holy Ghost to go out into their world and just to wreak havoc in the spirit and the powers of darkness. Like literally just to go out and like to start to shake in some, some cages, right? Till demons start coming out. And to go out and to lay hands on the sick and see the sick covered. To preach the gospel of the kingdom and see people's life delivered from the bondages that they're in. That this is my desire. This isn't enough for me. This doesn't satisfy. This isn't, it's not enough for me to stand up and preach Sunday after Sunday. That doesn't satisfy anything inside of me at all. I want to see the dynamic of the Holy Spirit. I work within us now. Can you say with me now? Now. That's what I need a now because I know my God is a now God. Amen. God is a God that he's I am. He's not I was and I will be sometime. He is I am. He is God that is now. He's a God who's active now. He's at work in my life now. No matter what season I find myself in, God is there to make me fruitful even in that season. I might be walking through difficult waters, but as was spoken prophetically today, I can find myself walking on the troubled waters when my eyes are upon the one who holds the water in the palm of his hand. So even if I fall, I'm not falling too far. Amen? Because I'm in the hand of God. David said, my soul follows hard after you, O Lord, because your right hand holds me up. And that's where I want to live. I want to live in the right hand of God. By the way, the right hand of God is the arm of power. Is anybody with me today? God is a now God. Can you say now? Now. It's time that now I walk in the promise of God. It's now for me to take hold of the promise of God. It's now that I walk in the purpose of God. I'm not worried about next week. I need now. I need God now. I need to walk in it now. I need to receive now. Is anybody with me this morning? If God said it, then I want it. If God said I can have it, I don't want to say, well, someday, God, I want it now, God, because you said I can have it now. Anybody with me today? Everybody's still okay. So concept of time isn't really in, at work here and filled. It's, it's, in other words, it, it could be yesterday, it could be today, it could be tomorrow. Um, part of that's contingent upon you. It's in the passive voice. The passive voice means that the subject is the recipient of the action, not the doer of the action. Whoa, that's too hard for some of us because we like to be the doers. But when it comes to the filling and every time you see be filled with the Spirit of God, the, the subject is never us. We're the recipient, not the doer. And we're going to find that out with God. We're never the doer. We're always the recipient. When it comes to grace, that's why it flows down. Can you say down? It flows down, because when it flows down, we're the ones who are the recipient. You know where it keeps us? In a humble position. If we keep a right attitude, we understand the word of God. We stay on our knees. We stay laid out, prostrate before God. God, I know I don't deserve it. I'm the least of the least of all the saints, but this grace has been given unto me. This grace which has exceedingly working power. This is at work inside of me, and it's for your good. I might be walking through some stuff, and you're looking at it. You can't even look because it's too hard to watch, but this is for you. It's good. It's okay. God is at work in it now. And the mood is subjunctive. And this is the part that's actually kind of scary to me. Let me read it. It says, the mood of possibility and potentiality. In other words, the action may or may not occur 
depending on circumstances. If that doesn't scare you, then I don't think you heard it. The possibility and the potentiality, but it's based on circumstances. In other words, how bad do you want it? Amen? That you might be able to comprehend with all the saints. So that in comprehending the love of God, which passes every dimension that could possibly exist, it goes beyond anything that you could grasp. It, it goes beyond anything that could be spoken against you by the devil. It's, it's greater than anything at work in the, in the world. It's the love of God, and the love of God is calling out. And if you receive and comprehend this love that's been poured out for you, you understand, I can't earn it. I don't deserve it. But I'll open up myself to receive it. Amen? Amen? Yes. Then the potentiality and the possibility becomes expectation. And we put ourselves in that position to receive from the one who is the one who's active in this whole thing of filling and say, Lord, let it be me. Mary said, let it be under your servant as you have spoken. In a response that my soul doth magnify the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my salvation for he has considered, he has considered basically my helpless estate. But God has worked in that and made her one that all nations and all generations would call blessed. Which brings us to Ephesians chapter 5 in closing. Am I still okay? Ephesians chapter 5. And verse 18. I've been enjoying my study in Ephesians. I don't know if you've been enjoying it with me. And Ephesians 5.18 says this, And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So the power and the potentiality and the possibility were expressed in the third chapter. And in the fifth chapter, the Apostle Paul is moving towards the closing of his letter, and he says this, he says, Be filled with the Spirit of God. Don't be drunk. Don't settle for anything else. Don't get intoxicated with the things of this world. Don't settle for second best or, or not even second best, something that will actually turn you away and say, this is good enough for me. Don't get, don't get inebriated by the things within this world. Drunkenness can come, as we've shared in previous weeks, from a lot of different things. In this particular instance, it's with alcoholic beverage. He says, don't get tied up in these things that are going to make you content or, or, or just take the edge off in your life because a lot of people want to take the edge off because they're being pressed, but it's in that pressing place that you fall upon your knees and it's there you recognize, I need action now. What alcohol does, it pushes it off to tomorrow. But when I'm in a place of desperation, there's a now that begins to come out of my life. God, I can't wait till tomorrow. God, I need it right now. God, I need a moment. I need a moment with you, God. I need you to, you need to just show up on this situation, God. Because if I can't have you right now, I don't want to breathe another breath. Has anybody ever been in that place before? But he says, don't settle for those things. He said, no, be filled with the Spirit of God. And now the tense changes. The voice remains the same, of course, because it's an action that comes from God. We're never going to be the ones who make it happen. You can't fill yourself. It's a work of God. It keeps us in that humble position. It makes us maintain the right posture so that God doesn't resist us, but he pours his blessing out on us. Is anybody with me this morning? Anybody want God in this place today? Because the tense now is present. It means the present tense represents a simple statement of fact or reality, views as occurring in actual time. In other words, this is happening right now. Now, this is something that is right now. Be filled with the Spirit right now. This is actual time. This isn't pie in the sky sometime in the, in the near future. This is right now. Be filled with the Spirit of God. The voice, as I said, remains the same. It's passive. The passive represents the subject as being the recipient of the action. And the mood changes from subjunctive to imperative. And it expresses a command to the hearer to perform a certain action by the order and authority of the one who's commanding. Be filled with the Spirit of God. And so I'm going to confront you this morning with the words of God. And he said this, this isn't something that you can just push off to the side. God said, as a command to you and to me, be filled with the Spirit of God. What are you going to do with that? With every head bowed this morning and every tie closed. What are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with it? Because we saw in the third chapter, the power and the potentiality are there. And it's 
based upon circumstances. You just heard the word of God. What are you going to do? And now he's saying, you be filled with the spirit of God. Are you hungry enough? Are you thirsty of God? Do you want God right now? Is this a moment right now? Can this be your now moment? Yeah, it's a little past time we're used to, but this is your now moment. This is the time where God has already spoken to us prophetically. He said he wants to make this place Rehoboam. He wants, uh, 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 sorry, uh, Rehoboth. Not Rehoboam, God, God forbid that. God wants to make this place, Rehoboth, he wants to make this place a broad place. He wants to make this place a place where there's, there's plenty of room, where there's plenty of water, where there's plenty of source, where people can find refreshment, where people can be edified and built up, where people can be sent out. God desires to do that. What are you going to do with that right now? What are you going to do with that? Seriously, I am so serious right now. What are you going to do with that? Are you going to hunger and thirst for God? This is the word of God. God, help us. Help us, Lord. If you want God, just let him know right now. Lord, I can't live without you. God, I need you. God, I don't want to complain that I'm hungry right now, God. I'm going to learn from those in the wilderness. I want the true bread that comes down from heaven. Lord, we need you. Oh, God, we need you. Lord, right now, right now, God, in this room, would you move in this place, God? Would you move in our hearts, God? Would you draw us to yourself, Lord? Would you help us to put everything else aside, Lord, God, and cast off every other encumberment, Lord, and say, God, right at this moment, Lord, I just need you. Would you fill me with your spirit? I don't want to live on empty. I don't want to drive on empty, God. I want to live full. God, I want to live full. So whatever detriments are there, Lord God, to help me comprehend the love that's so extravagant. Thank you, Jesus. The love of God. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Amazing love. Now flowing down from hands and feet that were nailed to the tree. As grace flows down, it covers me and covers me and covers me and covers me. And covers me. Oh, it covers me. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound, amazing love, now flowing down from hands and feet that were nailed to the tree. As grace flows down, it covers me. Lord, would you cover me this morning? Would you cover us, Lord? Would you pour out your spirit upon us, God? Would you hear the cry of the humble? Would you respond to our helpless estate? But we live in a world that's ravished by sin, Lord. It's time for the children of God to stand up and be the saints that you called us to be with a comprehension of spiritual things, Lord God, that excel and exceed and, and just all together, Lord, go beyond anything that we can grasp with our human understanding. Lord, you use the least of the least, Lord, to declare your glory that no flesh would boast in your presence. So here I am, Lord. Can you say that to the Lord? Here I am. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. Here I am. Lord, I pray this morning that you would work in the heart of every person in this room. That if this is not the now moment for them, Lord, that this would lead to the now moment in their life, God. That it wouldn't be able to be shaken. Father, this would be the time where the church would rise up and walk in your divine enablement, obedient to your call, your divine purpose, which flows down from above, that we would see, Lord, that your will will, your will will prevail, Father, in our lives, Lord, in our family's life, by the grace of God. We thank you this morning, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. All God's people said,